Thanks very much, Lyndon. Uh, just want to say thanks to IBM. Where else can you come on um, a night like tonight and get a beer and learn about AI? So can we give those guys a hand? Like, <laughs> All right, so tonight we're going to introduce this concept of uh, automated machine learning. How many people have heard of AutoML in the room? Oh, too many. That's good. Oh, that's a lot. How many data scientists in the room? Bonafide? Registered? Uh, I don't think it's a registered. All right, so so this is, uh, we're very excited to be here. The last time we tried to come, there was 41 centimeters of snow that night. Um, so this time we didn't let the snow get in the way. So just a little bit about us. Uh, Acadian was founded in 2007 uh, because we're in Calgary, of course. Oil and gas is one of our specialties. We have worked with power generation utilities. We've worked in finance. We've even done sports and entertainment because they have a lot of data, right? Um, we've got about 100 clients. Um, what we're building as a team internally is what we call data analytic, analytic specialists. So we don't use the term necessarily data science, but it's certainly part of our framework and it's certainly part of our offering. So um, the whole goal is to enable our customers with you know, the self-serve BI and analytics. And uh, we work with a number of partners, uh, vendor partners. You're gonna meet one today. And uh, a lot of them were sitting under advisory councils. So we're connected at the highest levels with these guys. So it's really, it's really awesome. The, you know, our whole goal is how do we take advantage of this exponential growth of information? Um, and I don't know if you guys heard, but everything we know today in 13 months will double, right? That's the knowledge of mankind in the next 13 months is going to double. Um, so what we have, this is our IP, and if you can, it's almost like a recipe for machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence in some ways. And we talk about information capabilities, not so much about products, but if you read this, like everybody's doing data prep, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, using a spreadsheet, uh, whatever it is, somebody's doing data prep. Uh, data wrangling is certainly a, a capability as well that probably would fit in there. But really, with a lot of our customers that are on this digital transformation uh, journey, and you can see this is our framework synapses for digital transformation, visualization and analyzing the data is, uh, you know, is the user that single pane of glass. And then one of the other capabilities you see is data virtualization. I'm going to show you a reference architecture in a minute here. You're going to spend a lot of time on it. But diarize is really the master data. Like, what do we do with master data today, right? Uh, from the perspective of, is it master data management? Is it just in time master data management? And then structuralize. I heard a question about uh, pulling in PDFs and Word documents, that type of thing, into your analysis. So one thing that we've learned about AI, if you want to train the models, basically you've got to have the content, right? You've got to have a lot of data. Well, the more data you have, the better, but it's got to be of high quality as well. And 20% of your information actually lives in a structured database. 80% of it actually lives in content. I don't know how many of you do that, but, uh, and really, structured data answers one question, which is what, and the why and the how comes from the unstructured data. So, anyway, and by the way, I'm just warming up so that uh, Niaz is gonna fill you in on all the details here in a minute. But, um, so, let's look at 2018, because it's almost over. But that's all the vendors in the big data AI landscape. So I don't know if anybody, have many people seen them? How many people are, or how many vendors are in here? Uh, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So here you are, you're learning something new called, well, some of us are on the journey for a little while around big data AI. And you know, this is the simple things that you need to know. So here's all your options that you have to use. And I bring it up because how do you distill this down? How do you simplify this complexity? And one of the cool slides that I see um, that I really like, because it kind of breaks it down into silos. It breaks it down into categories. And you can see this from left to right. You can see where big data fits. You can see where your traditional data fits. Um, you know, when you get into Hadoop, all the different capabilities around that. Um, you know, all the new languages that you have to learn, even like ETL, CBC, Scoop. Anybody using Scoop? And then it, and for a one scoop user two, awesome. And then of course data virtualization, which is very very key. And uh, we could give another talk on data virtualization, but that wouldn't be at this one. But uh, certainly it's critical. I think digital transformation means that you have to be able to get across all your digital assets. Very hard to do digital transformation if you're just talking to silos. 
So what I like about this architecture is it lays it out very, very nice. So we're going to spend some time tonight. I'm going to attempt to use this Mac, and I'm not Mac literate, uh, down here in the bottom corner. So basically, predictive analytics, statistical uh, analytics, uh, text analytics, not so much, but we're going to, that's the kind of category that we see where uh, AI and machine learning fits in, okay? So, um, just one slide. I have one slide to talk about why Data Robot, and that's who you're going to hear from today. Um, anybody in here familiar with Kaggle, the data science competition? Anybody ever participate in Kaggle? Oh, a couple. Hey, that's cool. So, uh, basically, Data Robot and why we, you know, one of the offerings that we have around them, what's very, very neat about it is data science itself is actually being disrupted. I'll use the disruption word. Because what's happening is software companies now are in, you know, encapsulating algorithms, um, knowledge of the algorithms, use of the algorithms in software. So um, what would you say if I asked you, what would be the average number of algorithms that a data scientist would know? 10? Yeah. yeah, let's say 10. So what if you could run 100? What if you could run 200? What if you could run 300, right? I mean, uh, algorithms have been around since the 50s. What these guys have done is they put together some software automation, and you'll see it tonight. We're going to show you a demo right after Niaz uh, takes you through her presentation. But the cool thing about this is every single one of these guys that you see up here on the top is actually competed in Kaggle. So the top 80 data scientists in the world started this company called Data Robot. How did they know they were the top 80? Because they competed in all the competitions. So that to me is, is pretty cool. And then from the perspective of what they're using and the technology uh, and how they've encapsulated, they're into their fourth round of financing now. So they're, the company's pretty, pretty new, but for people that are just trying to demystify AI and machine learning, it's a good offer. It's a great way to start to filter out some of the noise and actually get to, to uh, the actual uh, signal, right? So that's what we're gonna show you tonight. But before we do that, I'm going to pass this over to Niaz, and she's got a few slides she's going to take you through. Do you want to just leave it? No, yeah, it's better. Okay. Thank you. Hi, could you hear me? It's good? Okay. So, um, I'd like to walk you through the kind of some of the benefits of AI and why we want to talk about the data robot, which is a platform to automate the machine learning process. And I walk you through briefly in the whole machine learning life cycle and what data robot does to expedite the process. So this kind of a slight overview is some statistics from IDC that shows the businesses in the faster growing regions and industries, they already receiving the benefits of using AI and uh, that shows increase the productivity. It could be the higher level of the automation or discovering the insights that perhaps it wasn't possible before. So in terms of the financial aspect of it, if we look at the AI five years compound annual growth rate, which it describes the average growth per over a period of time, it shows 74% 74, 74 for Japan, um, uh, forecasted for 2021 with respect to 2016, which it shows the country with the highest uh, forecasted growth using AI in their you know, industries and everything they do. And in terms of, if you look at the industries, we expect that financial banking, financial services and insurance, they're gonna invest most in this area, which I, I don't think we're all surprised to hear that. Uh, so, Definitely, this is a direction that company they want to go, but we have to also acknowledge the challenges and barrier that we have, which there are, you know, there are good challenges. We have in the top kind of, uh, if we want to identify the top barriers, it's definitely the lack of data or too much data or, you know, the skill set, the challenges with the stakeholders to invest in this type of the solution because of the, we all hear about the risk associated with the high cost associated. So these are the challenges that we have. And on top of that, the one that definitely you all are 
familiar is the shortage of the data scientists or AI specialists. And I mean by true data scientists, that we know, you know, the term has been <clears throat> used vaguely since this, the sexiest job of the 21st century. So it's, we know that it's not easy to find, you know, good data scientists. And um, to, uh, the bigger challenge that sometimes is underestimated is the steps that we have to do to prepare data for the purpose of the modeling. So that means because of the volume of the data we have, these days, variety, velocity, all type of the challenges, we have to put the data, prepare, sign uh, spend significant time and effort to make the data ready for the purpose of the modeling. And then it's in terms of the collaboration between the team because we have to, we need to put the data scientists with the uh, subject matter expert from business to make sure that whatever we design as a result of this exercise is going to work for business. So we know these are all challenges. So definitely there is a gap. We can see the demand for predictive modeling, machine learning, AI is increasing significantly, but we don't have enough data scientists to demand to make it happen. So we need to find a way that expedite, uh, somehow expedite the process of creating, testing, researching, deploying this kind of model so we can give more time to the data scientist community so they can do more research and build more sophisticated and uh, you know, complicated algorithms. So that's why we are looking at the automated machine learning. And in here, we talk about data robot uh, because now company, they want to be AI-driven, ML AI-driven organization for a good reason because if they don't, the competitor, they're going to get ahead. And uh, to become AI-driven organization, that means we apply this type of the advanced analytics solution as part of every possible business process. Uh, which that means they're going to adapt to changes quickly because the world is changing around us. And then um, it also become kind of like a self-optimized to predict the future. So to do that, a data robot creates a data robot is a platform for machine learning, which automates the process of creating this type of the solution from beginning to the end. And it uh, leverages the open source libraries that is available. All these good people that are you know, contributing and building and enhancing. So why not to use those? And then it provides a simple and user-friendly interface, which hopefully you're going to see it in the demo. And uh, that enables user to use it and build this kind of solution. So Phil kind of show you why data robot from the, the you know the people that they built uh, they founded uh, data robot. I want to kind of emphasize more on the process and business side. So because of the interface, it enables the business users to apply the scientific function directly. It uh, provides a consistent methodology based on best practices to build the models. Because of the massive parallel processing happening behind the scene, it expedites the process of the training hundreds and hundreds of models, and then it gives you scores. It uses advanced machine learning techniques, such as time series modeling, multi-series modeling, boosting, bagging, uh, deep learning, uh, all kind of generalized additive, generalized linear, just name it, random forest, all of them. And it builds the predictive modeling workflow, assuming that you don't know the programming, you are, you are not interested to do the coding, or you don't need to do any manual in intervention in the process. The one that personally I really love it is automating the feature engineering, because in my experience in the past, I, I noticed that after using data robot that I was over feature engineering, which usually that doesn't really give me a good result. So uh, data robot does a really good job. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more. And it leverages the open source library that is available in the, you know, R, Python, Spark, H2O, XGBoost, there's so many. And Frederick may mention it in his demo. And it supports advanced tuning, but that doesn't mean it's a black box. We could also go and change those tuning, advanced tuning and optimization metrics if that's what we need to do. So, Another good news, on top of that, when we go through the whole exercise and we build the model that it works nicely for our scenario, for our data set, now we want to make it available in production so more users can use it. 
So that uh, data robot also expedite that step by creating, we can use data robot or a platform, and we can put it on the premise or in the cloud. There are different techniques. We're going to talk about it briefly. It leverages the parallel processing because of the uh, infrastructure behind the scene. It also, because of the interface and ease of use, it helps that the data scientists, they can work with the stakeholder, with the subject matter expert to be engaged into in, in the entire process, which that's exactly what we are looking for. It, uh, in terms of the deployment, it gives you option. You can have the native scoring. You can have exportable prediction. You can use the API, prediction API, different technique. It integrates with Hadoop, which I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. And it works with a variety of the enterprise data that could reside in the RDBMS, Hadoop cluster, SaaS, Alteryx, different type of technology. And another thing that I like about it is not black box. It gives you enough chart and scores and documentation and the method of explaining the results of the models. It's not just, okay, this is what it is, the score, take it and you know, use it. You can go and interpret the result of those models. So you can make a decision that which one works best for your scenario. And also it support advanced security in terms of authorization for the fine-grained security, role-level security, and in terms of authentication, it leverages the LDAP security and uh, also Kerberos. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Too slow? Good? Both. So the question is, is it only the data ingested? It does both. So you load the data, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more, and you're going to see it in demo, hopefully. Uh, but uh, the idea is you load the data. So I can talk about it, and then you let me know if you still have questions. So data robot automates. Every step in the machine learning process, and this is the high level kind of a step. We all know we spend significant time for the data profiling because we want to know more about our data. Uh, feature engineering, I kind of mentioned it briefly and we're going to talk about it more. Model training. So most of the tools in the market, as far as I know, they may just you know, automate one or a couple of them. Data robot goes, and if I'm not mistaken, and Frederick can, Frederick can correct me, uh, it looks at now over 850 million algorithms that is available from the open source library and have, has been trained and used by data robot. So it's increasing on a daily basis. And it goes through that process and it gives you the result and a scoring and optimization metric and you can look at it after it goes through the validation and cross validation. And then we select a model that it fits for our scenario and I'm gonna talk about that why I emphasize on that. And then we do the model deployment. So as you can see, it's a rapid prototyping and faster way to expedite the entire process. So I mentioned it integrates with Hadoop nicely. That means it's a light footprint. It doesn't require any uh, long running processes running on the data nodes. It uh, fits on uh, any standard uh, Hadoop spec commodity hardware. It leverages the HDFS for the storing. So if we have the data already stored on the HDFS, we can use it also to save the result of the models and you know other things. It used the yarn uh, container for loading the test plans and all the workload that is happening in parallel behind the scene. It used the native administration. Let's say in case of the Cloudera, we could use Cloudera Manager or Zookeeper. And it, as I mentioned, the open source machine learning libraries are Python, you know, all those good ones that you know it. And it uses Apache Spark to expedite the whole parallel processing and in, in memory computation. So those are the machine learning life cycle, which I'd like you to briefly go through each step and I say when, how data robot expedites those steps. So this is the one that typically we have to do. I, I'm hoping everybody does it. So we specify the business problem using business language, not the modeling language, and we want to be specific in terms of what's going to be the outcome of, outcome of this exercise. So if we get as much as we could get more specific, that's going to help us to measure our success better. And, we, and in this process, definitely, we want to use the subject matter expert to make that call. And then we decide that 
what's the granularity of the data that we need to use for the purpose of that business objective. Let's say if I use the retail use case, we have a row that it has the store ID, customer ID date, it has the purchase amount, and it has the number of items. So in this case, the purchase amount could, for me could be the prediction target. So something that I put in the data robot, I want to predict. This is very important, I emphasize. We want to prioritize what are the criteria that is important for us. Is it performance? Is it the speed, accuracy, familiarity, ease of use? We need to make that call because at the end, we want to make sure that how we say this exercise has been successful. If we don't define those things, it's going to get very complicated. And typically, usually we uh, start considering the risk, the time, cost, all those good things, and what could define a successful. So a data robot helps us to mitigate the risk, reduce the risk, and exploit the process. So it's not going to be that much you know, time consuming or expensive. So that's why it exploits this step of the process. So then we can decide that we want to continue. Then that's when we're going to get our hands dirty. We need to find the data set that we need for the purpose of the modeling. That could be public, internal, external data. We go through the uh, lovely practice of the data, uh, the step of the data integration. When we want to load the data into the data robot, we load it as a one single table. So definitely the data integration now is even more important. How we do that part properly to put everything in one single table to load it into data robot. So now do you ask the question what it does with the data? So uh, when we load the data, it goes through the exploratory data analysis, EDA1 and EDA2, and it gives us a good statistic and information about the uh, columns, attributes, column type, missing values, outlier. And another thing that it does a lovely job, it's finding the target leakage. So those are the ones that we are not supposed to have in our data sets. That's when the outcome is hidden inside the input variable. So it finds those, and it's, we can get rid of it, because otherwise we're going to end up with the unrealistically good prediction, which we don't want to have it. It's dangerous. So then it goes through the feature engineering. So it looks at the different type of the field, numeric, categorical, date, text, and it does a good, you know, enough feature engineering that is going to help to produce more accurate algorithm and uh, better performance. So for example, it creates the day of week from the date column or the age column from the year column. It does a uh, one hot coding, encoding, counter encoding, um, in, uh, imputation missing, all those techniques and are more drives feature. It doesn't do aggregation, but it gives you all the feature engineering that we need. So after it goes through this exercise, we define, okay, this is a value that I want to predict. And then we have the selection of the model. We can use the autopilot or quick or a manual. So when, if you select autopilot, it goes through the process and it goes, tries to find algorithms that uh, fits best for our data set and our target, you know, in terms of, you know, the column, the value, the type. It finds those algorithms from all the open source library and it starts building the models. And then it starts doing the validation and going through the cross validation. So it provides us the scores, the optimization metrics, and all the other information we're going to look at it. So it doesn't just look at, for example, linear and logistic because we know there are definite limitations with these techniques. Decision tree could be a good one that it could be used um, for the case of the, un, you know, to um, overcome the challenge of underfitting and overfitting. It looks at, for example, the random forest, which you are all familiar, familiar, so I don't have to explain. So it goes through those and it gives us the list of the model on the top with all the scores. So we can see, for example, the top 10, top 20, and also it does blending. So it goes and decide how to blend some of those models to get a better result. And also we could do our own blending. So then we get to the point that we have all this information, chart, the scores, documents, the blueprint of the models, the whole thing. So we can start interpreting and understanding what, has, what is happening and then which one is going to work best for our business objective and the criteria that we defined from in the beginning, in the first step. 
So we could use confusion metrics to evaluate the performance, for example, the leaf chart, which shows the actual versus predictive value, or the, for the binary target, we could look at the ROC curve. And these are more. So let's say I have top 10 models. I am kind of, you know, like the scoring happening here. Then I can start comparing those models against each other. Because the learning curve, for example, is a really good one that shows me if I, uh, is it worth what? Is it, there's a trade off that I add more data to get more accurate result, but is it worth it? Because more data, that means more processing. And it's going to be expensive in terms of the resource, RAM, CPU, but part of the processing, the whole thing happening behind the scene. So we have to make that decision. Do we want to do that? So we add, provide more data. Or we can compare the speed versus accuracy. And then maybe I narrowed on my list from 10 to 5, and then I start comparing two models at a time, looking at the dual lift, lift, and ROC curve. Depends on the target prediction, and prediction target. And then I can decide which one works best. And don't forget to look at the feature impact, because that's going to show, for example, for a given column, um, how, how worse the score could be if that column is going to get shuffled randomly in the data set. So it's going to give you a good information for that. And then it depends on the data set, depends on the use case, it could give you more information. So I can use all this technique for the interpretation and, and decide which one is going to work best. So the last step after I decide, OK, this model works better for my scenario with respect to my business objectives, then we can um, use different technique to make it available and deploy it to the production. So um, data robot provides different way. Data robot prime, we can use the just go and export it, and then you can um, even load your new data set. Goes through that model that you selected, and it gives you the prediction. And we can use the different uh, prediction API, REST, and um, um, uh, our Python are all available. We can use it. But it doesn't matter which way you choose. We have to, it's recommended that we have to document the whole process. That means the data sources, the process we took it. If we have done anything manual in terms of the advanced tuning, in terms of we build any, any model manually, we adjust the scoring, we change the per, uh, optimization metric, we have, to mod, we have to document that for the purpose of the reproducing the process again. Then it's 100%, 200% is recommended to do the active monitoring because we want to make sure that the model is going to produce the result that we are expecting. Things is going to change, new data set, new data format, a new uh, uh, format, and then all the business rules is going to change. So as soon as that happens, that means we have to go retrain the model and redeploy. So data robot provides, if we use the data robot, uh, Management console, if I didn't get the name wrong. And so that one, it provides a central point to monitor all the deployed model in production. So you can see all of them, and you can um, define wh what happened. You know, depends on the case. We can uh, look at it and get our attention that we need to go and retrain that model and redeploy. So that's going to help us to make sure that we provide the good performance for all the deployed model over time. OK, that was my last slide. All right, let's see if we can see this in action. Anybody want to see it in action? Maybe question? Uh, okay. One, sure. Yeah, go ahead. What mathematical, well, um, all of them, all kind of a statistical, you know, a statistical analysis technique has been used. There is no limitation, but also you can go and change those parameters if you want to emphasize on some of those. So there is a list of different optimization metrics, so you can go and tune those. There are so many different things you can go and change it, and that's why I like it. It's not a black box. I have control in terms of how I want to, you know, train the model and what criteria is more important for me. The specific package name? Well, I'm going to let Frederick to answer your question, or maybe we can take that offline, because it's not a specific package name. Okay. Yeah. So sorry, guys. We, uh, the guy that's doing our presentation today, I give him a lot of credit. He's, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, barely, yes, louder. Barely. Can you speak a little bit louder, buddy? Yeah, I just asked the same question. 
Right there. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I feel like there's a delay on, on your end. Okay, that's all right. Don't worry about our end. We just need you to talk louder. You just need your end. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, that's all right. Don't worry about our end. We just need you to talk louder. You just need your end. Louder. Can you, oh. go, can you go louder, Frederick? <laughs> I don't feel like I gotta come up here and hey, try again. I don't think that works. Uh, unfortunately, guys, I have a baby upstairs. <laughs> Do you have a basement? <laughs> oh, come on, no, no, it's good. Kidding. I'm kidding, Frederick. <coughs> can you guys hear? Like, move closer if you can't hear, right? And if you want to see this, I, I encourage you. Come on up. Okay, so as best you can, Freddie. Hey, Phil, let me try to uh, dial in. I think that's a good idea. Sure. Here, it could. Repeat the question. So you're asking who could be the no. end user of this kind of uh, platform, correct? So it could be mostly the business users that they're going to ask because, you know, they may not have time to do the programming and coding. <coughs> Excuse me. And also the data scientists. Even, you know, it saves time for the data scientists in the organization to use this kind of platform so then they can have more time to do research for the cases that, you know, is very specific for their uh, objective. And, no, the feature engineering... Yeah, we can hear you, Freddie. Can you speak, speak a little louder? Sorry, guys. Clustering is as part of it. Classification, all those things is after. The feature engineering is to make the, okay. uh, the additional attributes that is going to add value. It's going to give you the useful information, key information that is going to help for the uh, accuracy of the model. No, no, it doesn't automate. It automates it. However, when you do the data integration, you are still you could do your own feature engineering if that's what you want to do. It doesn't stop you. But if, when you load the data, and we say raw data, then it uh, starts looking at if there are more feature engineering that can be done. Okay, so can, can we pause on the questions for a minute? Just because I want to, just want to make sure Freddie's got a baby at home. He's two hours ahead of us. and. Okay, Freddie, go ahead, buddy. Perfect. So, again, I think the best way to, to understand data robot is to work through a real life business problem. And so today we're going to be looking at credit default. And so, what we're seeing right now is given loan data at the time of application, so we predict that the loan is at risk for default. Right? So, a very simple, straightforward business problem, but one that, of course, can have massive impact to uh, the company's bottom line, right? As a lender, and so we're going to Etc. And so today we're going to use this historical data set. Uh, this historical data set is coming from a company called Lending Club. It's a peer to peer lender here in the United States. And the whole idea is for someone to go online and submit a, uh, or apply for a loan, uh, I think up to $40,000. And so here we have our historical data set. This historical data set has different variables uh, categorical variables, numeric variables. Even on structured text, for example, look at employment titles. This is actually free-form text, right? Lending Club allows you to write in um, the title of your company, the, the name of your company, and so forth. Also, columns here, you can see here, uh, this is why you're using the loan, right? Why, why do you want this loan? For example, this particular individual is looking to consolidate the debt, pay for the I was thinking, but no one can hear it doesn't go. All of these, um, all of these variables, right, these predictors, uh, to be able to predict the future. Of course, the data historical target is going to be volatile. And that would be column A. And it's titled Gold Staff. This is a binary classification problem. Zero for no, one for yes. Okay? Now, once, once we have this data set in this tabular format, right, rows and columns, again, each row here corresponds to a loan application. Each column here, and each column is different characteristics associated with that loan. All right, so I'm now going to jump into the data robot uh, graphic user, uh, user interface. 
Uh, as Niaz mentioned, data robots can be deployed on premise uh, and it can be hosted on the cloud on AWS. Right now, I'm going to be using our data robot cloud instance. Uh, the the, the uh, user interface is exactly the same between the on premise instance and the cloud that we're working on. You can see here, you can begin a project by dragging a data set here or import it. There's a data source, you can connect to your, your databases, uh, point to a URL. Uh, you connect them, and then of course the local file. In this case, since my uh, file lives on my computer, I'm just going to drag this over. I'm going to upload it. As you can see, the data is being uploaded. It's reading the raw data, and it's going to perform, as Niaz mentioned earlier, the first round of exploratory data analysis. And then, of course, this is important because you want to get to know your data, you need to stand some summary statistics, and so forth. So give this a second while it loads. Alright, now that the, the data has been loaded, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here. You can see the data set has been ported over. Now, uh, data remote auto match is going to basically categorize the different variable types. Again, what is Generic, categorical, text, and so forth. As I mentioned, we're also using summary statistics because we wanted to break that load amount across the data set. And then you can click on that and then it gives you an Instagram distribution of those load amounts. Okay? So I'm going to go back to the top. Uh, and here it's asking, what would you like to predict? And again, that column that we're trying to predict is, is that. Right? So I'm going to start typing in here, is that. I'm going to click on this. Automatically, data robot determined it's a binary classification problem. Again, zero to known did not go bad, one to known did go bad. Now, before I uh, keep going, it's important to note data robot can also handle regression type of problems, right? So instead of maybe figuring out whether or not a loan is going to default, uh, we wanted to predict the yield of that loan, right? Um, and so instead of looking at just a yes or a no, we wanted to predict exactly how much, um, how much are we going to get out of that loan. Right, and in a dollars and cents amount. Data robot can also handle a multi multi class uh, problem, as well as time series problems. We have a time dependent variable, maybe we'll forecast the amount of loans uh, around the December time frame, uh, and so forth. You can also uh, run it in time series. But in this case, again, we don't have a time dependent variable here, so this is simply a binary classification problem. So at this point, you'll notice Data Robot has in the, in the middle of the, of the screen here. Start button, uh, and it's basically the, the system is ready to start the model building process. Before I start that, that model building process, I want to point out that at this stage in the process, Data Robot has put in place several guardrails. The guardrails that will prevent non technical users, non data scientists, with the ability to build very quickly, very accurately predictive models, right, without having to worry about, oh my god, did I make a mistake? Am I overfitting? And so forth. Of course, there is for advanced users, data scientists, there's advanced options, which you can tweak all sorts of uh, uh, things here from the cross validation. Right now, we're using five uh, fold cross validation with a 20% hold up. Uh, again, all of these things can all be tweaked uh, uh, use. But right now, I'm going to use the time level, so I'm going to use all of the default rates. Um, the analogy that I like to use here uh, you know, those SLR cameras, those fancy cameras, typically, you know, a non automatic and snaps really good pictures. You get that same SLR camera to a professional photographer, they put in a manual that maybe just they start tweaking things uh, and then might take a much better picture. The same idea applies here. You use that default and you'll still be able to build full class predictor models. Again, you also have the options to tweak it if you are an experienced uh, technical user. Alright, so at this point I think we're gonna I'm gonna go ahead and shift click the start button. I'm going to point your attention <coughs> to the right hand side. Notice the data robot is progressing through a series of steps, right? A series of steps that a data scientist would take. So instead of taking weeks or, or months for that matter, it's going to take minutes. And so, bottom line, um, it's starting to analyze your data. It's starting to analyze your business problem. And then it's going to start figuring out a series of uh, modeling approaches to solve blueprints. Blueprints are combinations of processing techniques, data transformation. 
and around their tuning, and of course a combination of different uh, resource algorithms. So right now data is going to take about 40 different groupings, and it's going to test them against each other. It's going to compete in a survival of the fittest type of competition. And so let me uh, make this a little bigger so you guys can see. So notice in the queue right now, we have 38 models um, in the queue. These models are coming from different open source libraries. Right now you can see this one is featured in Python at first. Uh, we're going to have libraries from R. We're going to have libraries from these data. Uh, robot icon is data robot for planetary models. Uh, we're going to have some from uh, TensorFlow, SVQ, and so forth. The whole idea is to test out a whole bunch of different uh, techniques uh, to give them a bubble up the best possible prediction model for your specific problem and your specific set. You'll notice here right now we have two models being built in parallel. Right? One is a Eureka model, the other one is a random forest classifier. Those are the top uh, where it says workers, and we can see about 20 total modeling workers. Think about worker as a quote unquote virtual data scientist. Right? This is the compute power. This is a virtual machine uh, that is going to be able, uh, that is going to allow you to build models. So right now we're building two in parallel, but I'm cutting this up all the way to 20 since that's my uh, my account has access to 20 modeling workers. So what that allows us to do is run 20 models in parallel. So of course it's going to expedite the process of building these models, competing them against each other, and so forth. I'm actually going to, like a cookie, so I'm going to go uh, to a completed project. Notice right now we built around 23 models, right? So this is the models that are working, and here are the models that we built. Notice that they're constantly changing, right? This is a dynamic leaderboard. As models finish completing here, they're going to be uh, ordered here according to this validation metric in terms of accuracy. We're looking at log loss. Log loss is just a measure of error. So the smaller the number, the more accurate the model. Okay? So let me jump to a completed project again. Great few models built so far. Uh, once that finishes completion, which will be in about 10 more minutes or so, you're going to build up to 79 models. Once the model building process is done, Data Robot is automatically going to ensemble the top performing models. So you'll notice that the, the ensemble models are uh, ENF Blender, and so forth. Data Robot will also automatically give you um, the tags of each of the most accurate models, right? And if I scroll down, these are all the models again that Data Robot built in all um, rank order in terms of accuracy. So notice right now, Data Robot is saying that this particular model, this Eureka completion stage model, is not only uh, accurate but it's also fast. So let's take a look at that in, in, in a little bit more. Uh, Click on this model here, and this is going to open up what we call the model split, right? This is a model approach, and this is dynamic. This is like basically the brains of data robot. So what data robot is telling you is here's your pipeline, right? The recipe that we use from data, uh, from the data ingestion all the way to prediction. So here's what it is for the categorical failures, which is the data processing techniques that we use, as well as the uh, specific algorithm. So for example, if we're going to know what ordinal and total Categorical variables for words, I can click on that. And I was going to get, if I get a uh, a short description, I can go to the model documentation. And now that's going to open up some more information on that specific ordinal and total table variables. Okay? And the same I can do with the, the, um, for the algorithm. For example, if I get to know too much about this gradient mean decrease, again, I can click the model documentation. And I can see all about this specific algorithm. Summarize what he's talking about. Summarize. Yeah. Okay. So that's a model blueprint. Uh, what I want to highlight, John, also for our viewers, which is different. They're dynamic. This model blueprint would never exist again. Right? This model blueprint really good. Based on your specific business problem and the data set that you gave the system. So, for example, let's say we want to look at, let's see what this one looks like. Let's see. So that's NetBlast Plus. It's a different recipe, right? And all of these models are going to have different recipes. Look at this one. Very simple. Greatest decrease. Right? So, again, let's stick with, uh, with the ones we looked at before. And we'll do a little bit more digging into this. So, general, once you're looking at the model, you can see the values of the performance. 
right? So we're going to go do this without any data. And this is a standard red chart for many of you in the room are going to see this chart. Again, we're taking a uh, range of predictions of bucket types in them. This came from deciles. And we want to track the predictor versus that across the range. But of course, with a lift chart, we want to make sure the model is, um, you know, separating you know, the, the low likelihood of the fault with the high likelihood of the fault, right? Again, that standard lift chart, of course, our lift chart that you have pointed out earlier with the confusion matrix and so forth. Um, but let me go and give you a scan test here. We want to understand the model, right? And so when I go to the scan test here, the first thing that opens up is future impact. And so future impact is showing the variables in the data set that have the greatest control performance, right, on the accuracy of this specific model. You can see, in other words, what are the most predictive features in the data set, right, as it relates to this particular model. You can see annual income plays a big role. Description, right? That was a test here, right? That was a preformed test. The description of why you're going to be using the loan is incredibly important to the prediction uh, that this model is going to generate. The interest rate, the title, again, another uh, preformed test, the terms, and so forth. All right, so now you've identified all the different um, uh, features that are important to this uh, model. And of course, from there, um, you can go down and see what is called prediction explanation. So prediction explanation. Um, let's step back here. So future impact is at high level, right? Now we know the, the levers that are affecting the prediction. But if I go to prediction explanation, you can see here that it's going to allow me to look at a very granular level. In fact, at the individual record level, not only the prediction, but also the, you know, why the model scored that prediction the way it did. Right? So it's essentially opening up that black box so that now you understand what levers are affecting the outcome. Of course, it's important because if you understand what levels are affecting the outcome, and those levels are at your disposal, right, you can change those, those uh, levels, then you can change that up in your data, right? So, for example, um, the record ID 6257 has an 86% chance of the fault here. And here's the explanation for why the model is, is uh, saying this. So, for example, you can see the description. The description is really in this case, there's a lot here. That is uh, uh, making the market decision of the first, the, the high likelihood of, uh, of the fall. The funded amount, of course, five thousand dollars. The terms of loan. So right now we're looking at the top three questions. But notice here I can go here and insert the three. So Freddie, look at up to ten explanations for why the model scoring these individual records the way it is. We can't hear you. Okay. Yes. Can you, uh, just because it's really hard to hear you, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, can we kind of wrap up the demo, maybe just with your final thoughts here, um, and then folks here are going to, if they want to see more or see this live in person, they're going to have to come stop by our office or have us come by, but um, can you, can you kind of just wrap it up here so we can open up for questions? Really appreciate it, pal, and sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's the room or just the way the HDMI is configured here. Um, I think half the room can hear you, but uh, I don't want to spend too much more time because not everybody can. Yeah, sure. Okay, so, perfect. So I'll, I'll wrap up here. The last thing, is, so once we have build, or build all these predictive models, of course, we need to operationalize these models, right? And so operationalizing models is simply a very difficult process. Uh, Data Robot makes it very easy because each model publishes a REST API endpoint. So it allows you to uh, essentially uh, three lines of code and copy paste your enterprise application into your front end system so that you can see those predictions. Uh, something, uh, you know, just to give an example of what that could look like here's a, a front end system. This could be a credit risk officer trying to figure out if they're going to uh, give a loan. They can create a quick record. John Doe. I'm going to use average values for, for, for sync time. And what this is going to do is going to Pull the uh, that specific model, and it's going to get a, a prediction. In this case, this specific individual has a 38 percent chance of, of the fall. You know the reason why the the fact that against that person in favor of that person. So again, this gives you a feel for how you can productionalize a model very very easily. So I'll leave it there. Again, feel to your point. If anyone wants to take a much deeper dive, they can uh, contact you, and of course, you can arrange for uh, a deep. Dive demonstration um, uh, at, a, at a later date. 
Awesome. Thank you very much, Freddie. Really appreciate it. Sorry, guys. I don't know how much you can hear of that, but uh, maybe what we'll do, um, can you ask and maybe recap, and we'll open it up for questions now. Uh, Freddie's, like I said, it's probably almost 10 o'clock where he is, so appreciate him joining us tonight. Uh, but why don't we open it up for questions, if that's okay? Uh, so those are, you know, different techniques, different type of the visualization. For example, the leaf chart, we just look at the actual versus predicted value. Oh, you mean in that reason, the one that it was showing? So those are the one that it's good to know that which one it contributes more for the prediction. So it's good to know the high end and low end. And that's after the model is trained, it's based on the result, it's going to give you, and you can select, show me the top, you know, three or top ten. So then it gives you, then you have a much better idea in terms of which range of the value is causing that prediction, you know, happens, or this model behaves this way. And then it, for example, is going to be some data quality issues or other things that also helps to put some, uh, you know, process around that because of those values. I can get you more information because every version they keep adding and changing the way it calculates those, you know, the reasoning code and other things. So if you want it, I, I can look at the documentation because they keep in enhancing. Yeah. Correct. Correct. The good thing with the data robot, it comes with a really good help. So as soon as you go, if from there you can click and then it takes you to the explaining behind that, okay, what type of the packages or what techniques you use. And it keeps up, they keep up to date and changing those, uh, you know, material as they enhance the every version. Yeah. Well, actually, I tried for, for what my use case, you know, I use the data for the production. Oh, sorry, repeating the question. So the question is, uh, is there any way to, uh, to kind of compare the result of the data robot with other tools? And also in terms of the is there limitation in terms of the use cases. So I tested when I started, I had like a data set for the production volume and I just put it, you know, I had my own work and I put it through data robot and I got a better result <laughs> from data robot. So that one I tested and it was because of the way I did some of the feature engineering that, you know, it kind of uh, make me more cautious about some of the way I've been doing it. Um, in terms of the data set, like in the previous version, they didn't have time series. So they just added the time series. So they keep enhancing. Or we had a use case, we weren't sure for the LIDAR data, you know, all the data for the images that you can identify is it low vegetable, you know, low vegetable, you know, high water, you know, root, other things. And we didn't think it's gonna do it because the limitation was for the multi-classification was only 10. So I had to get rid of some of them. Um, but it, uh, it it still the accuracy was really good. Like I wasn't sure. I just gave it a try to see how it works, and it worked. And now they even um, took that limitation, so it's not ten you know multi classes anymore. So you can even go further. So they keep enhancing some of the things based on the feedback they receive from the data scientists and the you know the community. They use data robots because you know it's not definitely perfect for every use case it's going to be some use cases we were going to see some limitation but they keep working and updating like now the version 4.2 or something if i'm not mistaken so i did that testing so if i had this model that this combination of different algorithms and it works nicely if there is no specific change on the data set the data for data type, you know, some new addition, other things is still, be, I'm gonna get pretty consistent result, but as soon as there is any change, I have to go and retrain it. And usually that's what I do, I go retrain it, <laughs> yeah. Correct, but because it expedites that process, at least you know, you know the whole thing, you know you have a pretty good uh, estimate of how long it takes the first time, it took the first time, so you can just, you know, load the data. And uh, also, I noticed that as you add more data set in terms of the number of rows, that also um, improves the accuracy. Yeah. I, well, definitely is accessible. <laughs> it says there's some cost associated, which I don't have that information. Definitely we can get that information. Uh, for, for me, it's a matter of you get access to the data robot and it's just a browser. You saw the Chrome browser, so you log in and then you have access to the environment. What it makes a difference in terms of the number of the worker that you need for that parallel processing behind the scene, because if you have more, then it's gonna grab more uh, algorithms to run in parallel. And if the worker is not 
enough, it's going to take longer. So that makes a difference. So from the accessibility and licensing perspective, so Data Robot comes in a couple of different flavors. Like what you saw here today was uh, it was a cloud offering. So you can get an offering uh, for so many workers for a cloud um, for a set price. It also runs uh, standalone, though, and it will run in massive parallel processing on Hadoop. So you can actually, so one of the things that Niaz talked about, uh, there, is a, there is a data robot for Hadoop as well. So there's a couple different things. If you have more questions on that, happy to, happy to take them. We'll take it offline. All right, yeah. sounds good. Gentlemen here in the, in the front. So the question is, when we load the data, is it going to give us any feedback in terms of the quality of the data? Yes, it does to some level. However, what we, because I'm picking in terms of the data integration, usually I try to do that before I load the data. However, it, if you have duplicate columns or missing values or uh, outliers or you know something, you can see the format, it doesn't make sense like it's date, but uh, there are some data quality issue, it's going to highlight it, yeah. yeah. And it's going to show you that you have to get rid of that. So it gives you some messages. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you have an option. So the question is, if you already deployed a model and you're happy with it, and year after, usually it doesn't happen. It's a couple of even weeks after. And the year after, you come back and you want to kind of retrain the same model. You don't want to end up with another model. Yes, you can use the manual option. So I mentioned the modeling mode is a autopilot and quick and manual. So you have that control that you can exactly you, you have you can have full control in terms of which one you want. And, and actually, just to add, but the best part is you can do it quickly, right? So to go back and retrain it, it's it's going to take a fraction of the time. And there was a question earlier just on the who are the users of Data Robot, and one of the slides that I've seen is. And this is where we start to talk about the rise of the citizen data scientist as well. Because what we've done is, or what the product's done is encapsulated all the sophistication around data science into a platform that somebody that's, you know, a business user that understands the data can actually leverage as well, which is super cool. Because there is that gap between all the data science work that needs to happen and the people that can actually do it. So, okay, question over there. So they, you know, you remember I mentioned about the documenting the process. So uh, the data robot provides you a checklist of the documents that they suggest that you do that work because of the for you know same reason you know in terms of the versioning and other things. Most of the time you may do some manual you know change, changing middle of the you know the process or you know you stop something and you change something and let it run again. So you need to capture all of those so you can reproduce. And uh, um, in terms of the specific version controlling, I have to look at it. I think now they added. It wasn't in the version that I used it, but I, I, I read it somewhere. I have to verify, and I can ask Frederick. So we can give you more information about that. I mean, is it Git-based or? Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can have different. Yeah, they provide different. OK, so one more question the gentleman over there in the blue sweater. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it is a scary. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and that's a great question. I mean, I actually, I think it's the inverse of that. I think it's some, we're taking something that's super complex and a lot to it and a lot of knowledge. Um, you know, very, very smart people in this room tonight know about math, statistics, know about data science, all the techniques, R, Python. What we've done is we've encapsulated that. In fact, what I like about it is it's a good opener to demystify data science. And what we haven't talked about is once you find the algorithm that you're looking for, now you can take that algorithm, take it outside of Data Robot. Yeah, you can do that and too. Then, and then you can run it wherever you want. I'm not sure about the licensing, though. That's okay, different. Yeah, but yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have to follow up with uh, Freddie. But, <laughs> That's, I but, forgot about that. But it's really what, what's good. And you know, listen, uh, and how many people in here are oil and gas, working oil and gas? OK. So everybody says the technology adoption curve for oil and gas is they're fast followers, right? That's what everybody says. <laughs> the reality is that they're more on the laggard side. So, and I'm not picking on oil and gas, I'm just using it because it's the large percentage of people in the room. But what this helps is really the speed, and if not else, speed your beginning into data science uh, and machine learning. I think what it does is it helps to validate the work that you're doing. And as a data scientist, why wouldn't you want to have this tool? as something that you can leverage to validate already the air, really the exper experimentation that you're doing. Okay. So from a, from a 
I think from a business perspective, it's great. I mean, we do work with other uh, machine learning technologies and we have other partner products that we also leverage. But I think for me, uh, it's a quick way to you know find out is there is there an opportunity or is there value in using machine learning on a data set that I have? I think that there's a different answer, but I don't know. So rather than spending potentially a year to figure it out, I can figure it out in a week. That's pretty good, right? That's pretty good. So anyway, Lyndon's looking at me.